بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ومن سار على نهجه واكتفى أثره إلى يوم الدين يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته uh, It is indeed uh, a very momentous occasion and I thank Allah for giving me uh, the ability and the chance to be with you this afternoon uh, for this convention with the theme, the quest for balance, attaining success in both worlds. And uh, uh, the topic of my own talk is on model believers earning and living halal. Uh, this is a, a very important topic because as human beings we live on this planet and we have to strive and earn a living based on what Allah wa Allah has given us of resources, uh, human resources, our mental faculties, our physical strength and also the physical resources that Allah has subjugated to us. Allah has said, وَسَخَرَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا مِنْهِ He has subjugated to you what is in the heavens and in the earth, all of it for your own sake, for your own benefit. So, living a life and earning a living is a necessary part of our creation that is why the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said asdaqul asma al harith wal hammam the uh, the most certain and the truest names are al harith the one who tills the earth and al hammam the one who is always having uh, who is always moved by a strong and powerful intention earning a living is is a, after being a necessity in the Quran is a natural necessity after being a natural necessity is also commanded by Allah and his messenger and uh, the world is not frowned upon and earning a living in it is not frowned upon because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said there is no monasticism whereby you turn away against the world. In Islam there is nothing like that. But the world is regarded as a cultivating place for the hereafter. The world is regarded as a cultivating place for the hereafter. Allah Tabarak Wa Ta'ala, He informed us of the exhortation that was given by Allah wa ta'ala to Qarun who was a member of the community of Musa alayhi salam and his people out of the light of the guidance of Musa alayhi salam exhorted him and called his attention and told him وَابْتَغِ فِي مَا أَتَاكَ اللَّهُ دَارَ الْآخِرَةَ وَابْتَغِ فِي مَا أَتَاكَ اللَّهُ دَارَ الْآخِرَةَ وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا And seek from what Allah has given you of the wealth of this world, seek the hereafter with it, the, the abode of the hereafter, and do not leave your portion of this world. 
do not leave your portion of this world. So this shows that the dunya is what you will use in cultivating and preparing for the day of judgment, for the al-akhirah. So wealth and seeking wealth in this world and going after the resources of this world are not frowned upon. Actually, we were taught by, the, by Allah Taala himself that when we are praying, we pray for good in this world and for good in the hereafter. Said, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ And among them are those who say, O oh Allah, give us good in this world and give us good in the hereafter and save us from the torment of the hellfire. This verse was revealed in conclusion to what happened when people found it abhorrent and unacceptable to be engaging in trade and acts of seek going after the world while in the period of Hajj. In Mina, after the Hajj, there used to be three markets, Okad and Dhul Majaz al Majanna. Ibn Abbas said people found it un unbecoming to be engaged in trading while they were in the state of, of performing Hajj. And then Allah says, Laysa alaykum junahun an tabtagu fadlan min rabbikum. There is no harm on you to seek favors from Allah, to seek, to seek the favors from Allah. So what you, when you engage in an act of trade, Allah has called it al-fadl, favor from Allah. So there is nothing to frown upon in going after wealth. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one time when uh, he told one of his companions, Amr bin al-As, who had been a strong enemy of Islam before accepting Islam, he said, I'm going to appoint you as a leader of an expedition and you are going to get booty and you are going to get a lot of wealth Amr bin al as he said messenger of Allah I did not accept Islam to gather the wealth of this world I accepted Islam so as to strengthen Islam and to be with the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said to him ni'ma al salih lil mar'i salih how excellent is good wealth for an individual who is also a good and righteous person. And it is one of the, of the constant prayers of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam every morning. He will say, Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'a wa rizqan tayyiba wa amalan salihan mutaqabbala. This was reported by Umm Salama. Every morning after the Fajr prayer, he will say, O oh Allah, I ask you useful knowledge and a risk and tayyiba and a sustenance that is a wealth that is halal, that is pure, and also deeds that is acceptable in your sight. Every morning he used to do this prayer three times after Fajr. And seeking increase in it is also not, there is nothing abhorrent in, in seeking increase in it and acquiring a lot of it because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said whoever wants his wealth to be made abundant that is an yubsata lahu fi rizqihi his wealth to be made so much and so abundant and also to be given respite in his in his appointed time that is, he is given long life, then he should, uh, he should keep the relationship of his, with, his kin, with his kin's folk. He should establish relationship and maintain good relations with his near relatives. Imam al-Bukhari said, in, when, when citing this hadith, he said, the one who seeks abundant wealth, to show that this is something that is acceptable. And one of the pray, one uh, of the, uh, 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 the the prayer of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam on Anas ibn Malik, 
who kept the company of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for 10 years, serving him as a young man. Uh, his mother, she brought him to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was a small boy and he stayed with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for 10 years. One time, Umm Muslim, his mother, she said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, this is your small servant. Please pray for him. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allahumma akthir malahu wa waladahu wa msa'lahu fi umuri, fi, fi umuri. O oh Allah, make his wealth abundant and make his children also many and give him a long life. And Anas lived a very long life. He lived over a hundred years and he was so wealthy that when he had an orchard in Basra, that orchard used to produce grapes twice in a year when all the orchards in Basra were producing grapes only once in a year. And he was extremely rich. So there is nothing to frown about, there is nothing abhorrent. If it was something that was, not un that was unacceptable, the Prophet ﷺ will not pray for, uh, uh, for Anas to have a lot of wealth. After the battle of Uhud, and the, when the victory was seen, after the, uh, then the scales of war turned, after the disbelievers had left Medina, the Prophet ﷺ told his Sahaba, stand up, I want to give uh, enormous praise to my Lord. So they stood up and stayed after him in rows. And the Prophet ﷺ prayed. And part of, the thing, uh, part of what he said in his prayer is, Allahumma absut alayna min barakatika wa rahmatika wa fadlika wa rizkik. O oh Allah, make abundant for us from your blessing and from your mercy and from your favor and from your wealth. So he asked abundance for himself and for the Sahaba to the end of the dua which is in Sunan al-Nasai. But, but there are hadith that have come in the Quran uh, in, the hadith, in the collections of hadith on the authority of the Prophet وسلم, that shows that wealth that described wealth and abundance of it as a cause of trial. The Prophet وسلم, said, Inna li kulli ummatin fitna wa fitna tu ummati al mal. Every community has its cause of trial, and the cause of trial for my community is wealth. So how can we uh, synchronize and harmonize between the quest for abundant wealth and then the apparent warning in this hadith that wealth itself is a cause of trial? There is no contradiction in this. The wealth that is abundant, that we are supposed to go after it and ask Allah for that, is the pure wealth the halal wealth and the, the wealth that is a cause of trial is the haram wealth the wealth that is haram that is impermissible the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said inna hadha al mal inna hadhihi al dunya hulwatun hadira wa inna hadha al mal hulwun hadir faman akhadhahu bi haqqih yubarak lahu fihi وَمَنْ لَمْ يَأْخُذْهُ بِحَقِّهِ لَمْ يُبَارَكْ لَهُ فِيهِ وَكَانَ كَالَّذِي يَأْكُلُ وَلَا يَشْبَعْ He said this world is fresh, greenish, denoting freshness, and is sweet. And this wealth that you see is fresh and sweet. Whoever takes it by its due right, then he will be blessed in it. And whoever takes it without its due right, he will not receive any blessing for it and he will be like the one who is eating and he is not having his fill so he will be he will be he, he, he will be gathering and gathering and nothing will satisfy him that is he doesn't have satisfaction so the wealth that is discouraged is that wealth that is deprived of blessing the wealth that is deprived of baraka 
and the wealth that is promised, the wealth that is uh, praiseworthy, the wealth that we are asked, we are taught to ask Allah to give us its abundance, is that wealth that is pure, that wealth that is halal. On account of this, every Muslim must know what is permissible and what is impermissible because each and every one of us, he goes after his sustenance, he goes after his livelihood. The essential things, the thing in Islam, you don't, go, you don't count permissible things because everything on earth is made permissible. Allah is the one who created for you what is on earth, all of it, for you. So everything that is on earth is made permissible to us. What we need to know is the impermissible things. We need to know the things that are impermissible because they are the ones that are limited. They are the ones that are countable. But the permissible things are uncountable which shows that there is no constriction upon a Muslim to find a means of subsistence. Because everything on earth has been made permissible. And the things that are impermissible are limited, are countable. And if you, so long as you observe the limits of Allah and you turn away from those few unpermiss impermissible things, every other thing is permissible to you. And this is a mercy from Allah. And this is a favor from Allah wa ta'ala. And this shows that there is no constriction. It shows that haram is not, uh, is not uh, inevitable. Even though the Muslims might enter a time when, hala, when haram, the impermissible, has become so abundant and so common as to make the permissible apparently non-existent or difficult to get. The impermissible things, normally according to the fuqaha, they mention, uh, they mention five classical and fundamental impermissible things. And the first and foremost is dealing in items that are declared as illegitimate. Some, and something that is illegitimate is something that you cannot own. You are, not, you are not permitted to own it. Anything that Allah has made it impermissible for you, you can't own it. And what you cannot own, you cannot trade in it, you cannot give it out as sadaqah, you cannot give it out as a gift, you can only dispose of it. Under this category is uh, the haram food items, dealing in them like pork, like, the, 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 like dead animals, like the meat of domestic monkey, uh, donkeys, like alcohol, like buying and selling uh, idols, like dealing in haram activities, like pornography, pimping, adultery, all these are impermissible items, impermissible, um, impermissible things that you are not permitted to own them. If you own it, your ownership of this item or the price of this item will only de deprive you of blessing, as Hassan al-Basri has said. Whoever earns well through impermissible means, if he holds it, it is, there is no blessing for him. If he gives it out, if he spends it for the cause of Allah, there is no reward for him. And if he leaves it with him till he dies, it will be his treasure it will be his provision it will be his provision to the hellfire well so that is why under this the fuqaha they say that the fundamental rule is that haram wealth is not owned you have to dispose it and when you are disposing it you are not giving it out as charity no you are giving it out to someone for whom it is permissible because haram does not go beyond the one who com who earned it if you earn a wealth, it is haram for you, but for another who did not contribute or who did not take part in earning it, it is halal for him. So that is why it is disposed by giving it out, not as charity, but as a disposal. The second seriously objectable thing is a riba, usury, which has so permeated all modern financial dealings. 
especially dealings involving currency, dealings involving money and capital markets. Haram, uh, riba, which is the practice of earning interest on loans, whether consumab consumable loans or commercial loans, this is uh, haram in the book of Allah and in the Sunnah. And its ramifications and the warnings that has come regarding it, it deserves an entire lecture in itself. But it is the basis behind which bank interest is prohibited and owning money market instruments that are based on interest, on dealing in interest, whether the interest is based on a loan from corporates or a loan from sovereigns or a loan from sub-sovereign governments in the name of government bonds, treasury bills, corporate bonds, they are, if they are interest-based, they are all haram to own and the earning is haram wealth. This is the kind of wealth that is unacceptable. The next is any money that you get through specula excessive speculation. Excessive speculation is you enter into a contract whereby you hide, you, whereby you consume the money and the wealth of others without a just cause. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala has said, uh, O you who believe, do not consume, do not devour the wealth of one another wrongfully, except if it is based on a business transaction, a commercial transaction that is based on mutual consent among yourselves. Mutual consent is when you are exchanging something that has value for something that has a counter value. You are sure of what you are giving and you are sure of what you are getting. If there is any doubt as to the counter value or as to the time of delivery or as to the ability to deliver, then it is consuming one's wealth without a just cause. And that is haram. It is based on this that dealing in excessive speculative deals like dealing in derivatives and dealing in futures markets, whether of commodities or of forex or of, uh, or of any other money market instrument that is based on speculation. It is regarded as haram because of this element of, specul of excessive speculation. The other thing that is prohibited is gambling. Gambling is a kind of game that is a zero-sum game. I will earn and you will lose. Business is not supposed to be like that. Business is supposed to be we will both earn. But whereby I will, only, I will only earn when you lose, then that is gambling which is not permissible. So dealing in casinos or giving out or helping someone who is dealing in casinos, like giving your house uh, leasing your, your property to a casino or to someone who is doing pool betting, these are all regarded as haram sources of wealth. Then it is the other type of practice that is regarded as haram is, which is a, a, a whole category of actions and activities that are based on lack of transparency, deceit, and hiding of defects of the items that you are dealing in. Any, any act of business whereby you are after hoodwinking the counterparty is a source of haram wealth. Whatever you get from that is not permissible. Now, based on this, it shows you can see that the, the avenues haram practices are quite limited. Even though in modern society, they have become so wide and vast as to permeate all business dealings, especially dealing in riba. Because the bedrock of modern finance is interest-based transaction. Interest is so fundamental to all dealings, all money dealings, in money and capital markets, 
as to make it almost impos imp impossible for a person to find a commercial paper that is purely halal. On account of these uh, Muslims of, of modern society, under the leadership of their scholars, they developed alternatives. Because if the whole, as the adage goes of one of the scholars of Islam, if the whole world was filled with haram, there must be a source of halal for a Muslim. I mean, it's not possible for a Muslim to be surrounded by haram all over without having any halal avenue. And based on this, alternative finance was created, which is the Islamic financial, uh, Islamic, financial Islamic system of financial intermediation that uh, observes these prohibitions. No riba, no dealing in unlawful items, no excessive speculation, no gambling, no unlawful trade practices. In order for them to do this, they developed alternatives to interest-based borrowing through trading. Because the basis of interest-based borrowing is on the time value of money. The time value of money whereby you talk of an opportunity cost. If you don't use your money now and you give someone to make use of it, he has denied you, he has deprived you of the, ch of the chance to use it. And for you to wait for him to return for you that money, you earn a cost, uh, you earn an amount in lieu of the time value of money for making him use that money and also for denying you of the opportunity to make use of the money to get an earning. This is the basis of interest-based transactions. And under Islamic finance, the same concept of time value of money is acceptable, but when it is tied to an asset. When it is tied to an asset. And this is one of the things that has obscured the understanding of some people in regarding, uh, in regarding delayed payment or delayed delivery transactions as being equivalent to riba. A simple example is the way they, is the, uh, is the, the loans or the, the airtime that people buy on credit from uh, telecom service providers. When you buy airtime for 500 and they take a service charge of 50 naira, some people take this to be equivalent to an interest-based transaction. Based on what? Because they think you are dealing in a delayed payment transaction. There is the issue of the time value of money, but here what are you exchanging? You are not exchanging money for money because the telecoms provider is not giving you 500 naira, it's giving you an airtime. And that airtime is a commodity, it's an asset. So when you exchange an asset, even if you observe the time value of money, there is nothing wrong with that. And as a result of this, uh, based on the, the basis for this, is the verse of the Quran that spoke of this kind of transactions. Allah says in the longest verse of the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu idha tadayantum bidaynin ila ajalim musamman faktubu. O you who believe, when you deal with one another on delayed payment or delayed delivery transactions, then put it in writing. These are the kind of dealings whereby there is the time value of money. You buy a phone for a spot price that is equivalent to 10,000, then you buy it for delayed payment for 12,000. This looks like riba because you might say that if I go to someone and took 10,000 from him, and I, go and, buy, uh, and I go and buy the phone on spot, I pay the vendor 10,000, and I pay the one from whom I borrowed 10,000, 12,000, is the same as me taking the phone from him and paying him 12,000 at the end of the month. And this is what the Mushrikun said, they said, Innamal bay'u mithlul riba. 
This kind of trading is just like riba. And Allah refuted their claim. He said, riba. The difference is the asset. When you are in riba transactions, you are only dealing with money. Now, uh, because of this, the permeation of riba, and the alternative that we have got, we have to uh, really undertake a very serious campaign to facilitate for our team in youth access to finance and access to business for their startups and for the growth of their business in a halal way, that is a way without interest. Now, how can we do it? It has to be through the solutions that, has been pro that is provided by Islamic finance. Take, for instance, the government has got a lot of intervention funds through the, uh, the, the, through the Apex Bank and through the development banks. And these intervention funds, because they are all based on interest, in the mosques, we receive, we receive lots of inquiries. People want to take these funds, people want to grow their business, people want to start up a business, but then they, when, the moment they see that there is an interest rate in the, trans in the financing, whether it is a single digit or double digit, they say we can't take it. Definitely it is interest, whatever name you give it. And that is why we have to seriously and vigorously campaign because it is a right of Muslims as citizens of this country that have been financially included in the uh, formal financial sector as a result of the introduction of Islamic banking. As a result of the introduction of Islamic banking, many people that had hitherto not ever opened an account were able to open an account, and by that they have a BVN and they are part of the formal financial sector. Now because of this, they shouldn't be disenfranchised disenfranchised from the intervention programs of the government that is made in order to have even development in the country. And uh, uh, alhamdulillah, the central bank had taken the initiative because last, uh, some, uh, last year, towards the end of last year, one of the commercial agriculture, uh, 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 one of the schemes, the commercial agricultural credit scheme, a non-interest version was introduced. And from what we heard, the central bank is determined to get alternatives, non-interest alternatives for all the other intervention schemes. And it is a right. Other countries have done it. In the UK, uh, the, the governor of the Bank of England, this was, what made him this was what made him to create the Islamic Finance Working Group. Because when he realized that people could not, that Muslims could not take conventional mortgages to own houses, he couldn't believe it. And he said, if that is the case, then there has to be an alternative, a mortgage that is compliant to the tenets of the beliefs of Muslims. So it doesn't stop in intervention funds, in mortgages, in all aspects of investments. The government has started issuing sukuk. Last year they issued a sukuk, a sovereign sukuk, which is an alternative to the conventional bonds, an alternative to the treasury bills. People that had surplus funds, they could easily invest. In many countries, they are able to issue retail sukuk for people with small savings. This is better for them than for them to enter into the Ponzi schemes that are, wide, that are wildly being introduced every time. In Ramadan, one of those Ponzi schemes was even sending uh, text messages to the ulama doing tafsir in their mosques. Uh, maybe they wanted them to propagate and uh, advertise for them. They called it Ramadan gold. Ramadan gold. It's a kind of a Ponzi scheme to get the money of small savers and then they will, it, will, it will just disappear just like the MMM, like the Swiss Golden, like all those, these Ponzi schemes that are not regulated. If you want to get money from the public, you have to go through the regulator. You have to be regulated because you are gathering money from people and you do not have these people that are giving you their money, they don't have access to your accounts. You are not obliged 
to have an audited account and make an, uh, uh, and then declare your audited accounts with internal and external auditing, with the regulator sanctioning what you have done, and then having an annual general meeting of all those who have contributed their funds so that they can see clearly where the funds, their funds have gone. People that are doing this, that are creating this kind of Ponzi schemes, they are not regulated. And that is why when you go and invest in this kind of schemes, you are on your own. You are on your own. And if you lose your money, it is just between you and yourself. But if it is regulated, and the way for it to be regulated, if it claims to be Islamic, there has to be, some, there has to be a mechanism to ensure that it is Islamic. The central, for instance, the central bank, despite its being uh, a secular institution, but it made it imperative on every bank that is getting an Islamic license, it has to show to its consumers, to its, de to, to its uh, customers, that it is not only being Islamic, it is not only being Sharia compliant, but it is seen to be Sharia compliant. These are the things we should be asking about whenever we come to this kind of schemes so that we'll protect our wealth and so that we'll have rightful earning. Definitely, there is no way that uh, the small, the, the micro, small and medium enterprises sector, which, is, which has been described as the engine of growth in many economies, there is no way that it is going to grow without access to capital. And just because uh, taking capital on, a non, on an interest basis is declared as haram, it doesn't mean that you cannot have an access to capital. You can have an access to capital. You can have access to equipment financing. You can have access also to working capital based on a non-interest uh, program. And uh, uh, let me complete my talk by the statement of one of the tabi'in, just to show that the question of uh, seeking abundant wealth from the halal way is, uh, is a fundamental principle in Islam, and uh, the important thing for us to do is to observe the limits of halal and the limits of haram, which are very clear. They are not obscure, because the Prophet ﷺ said, al-halal bayin wal haram bayin. They are not obscure. Halal and haram cannot be confused together. This statement is by Sufyan al-Thawri. He said, Al-mal fi hadha zaman silahu al-mu'min. Wealth in these times is the weapon of the believer. This was their times. Sufyan al-Thawri, he died 160 years after the hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ. So this is his, uh, you are talking of about 13 centuries earlier, he said, in their time, wealth is the weapon of the believer. What more of our time? And Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, he said, لا خير في ما لا في من لا يريد جمع المال. There is no good in the one who doesn't want to go after wealth and, uh, uh, and, and acquire it and gather it, because by that wealth, he will protect himself, he will be good to his relations and he will give out the right of Allah on it. Because for you to be able to feed the poor, to do an endowment, to give out the zakah, all these, they are only, it's only possible for you to do it when you have wealth, you have to, you have to stand up and earn. And alhamdulillah, with our effort and with our determination, we can have a source of earning, a source of raising capital based on the Islamic financing uh, mechanism that has been introduced in our economy and that is also being strongly supported uh, by the government. So we have to vigorously go after it and engage members of the uh, legislature to come up with more legislation that will support the sector and also engage the development banks, engage our, our employers in coming up with alternatives that are 
interests that are free from interest so that we will not be in this in disenfranchised there is no reason for us to be disenfranchised and with this we can see that it is quite possible in this age to earn and live the halal way and we ask Allah wa ta'ala to uh, give us the strength and also the basira the awareness to follow his path and earn the halal way wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh